thousands of sailors and soldiers on this day long ago. And so I'd ask you to join me in a minute of silence in recognition and honor of that terrible event. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. Thank you all. As we begin this exploration, not only are we supported by the talented team here inside the control room, who you'll be hearing from shortly, the 50 people on board Nautilus uh, who have made this voyage into Papahanaumokuakea, but also the expertise of uh, specialists, talented people from all different agencies, different institutions, different nations who care for this history and care for this place. Uh, we are joined by our extensive network of scientists ashore, including um, archaeology specialists joining us from the Exploration Command Center in Silver Springs, Maryland at NOAA headquarters. I'd like to invite those voices into the conversation um, and welcome all of our partners that have made this possible. Hello, ECC. Good evening, everyone. And good morning here in Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm Jeremy Wyrick. I'm director of NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. With partners with Ocean Exploration Trust and all of our other partners within the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute that have been able to make this happen here today for Nautilus. So we're here. It's about 2.30 in the morning here in Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm very privileged to be joining you all everybody listening in, but certainly all of our friends and colleagues there on Nautilus to be able to join in on what is really a very humbling sight for all of us. So here in Silver Spring, Maryland, I'm joined by um, Jim Delgado from Search. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim. And before that, I have uh, guests here from the Naval, Historic, Naval, Naval Heritage Historical Center, and I'll turn it over to Alaska. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexis Kitson. Uh, I head the Naval Security Heritage Command Underwater Archaeology Branch. And I think privilege is the, the right word because I'm very fortunate to be a part of the operation we'll be doing this evening and be uh, visiting this site. It's very important for me. Jim. Hello, everybody. This is Jim Delgado. I'm Senior Vice President of Search Incorporated. Work closely with Mike Renton and many other people. I'm lead uh, scientist sure. Uh, but with that, what that job title means is working to coordinate uh, with an incredibly talented team from different agencies and organizations. While some of us are here in Silver Spring, we have colleagues from the Defense KWMIA Accounting Command ashore. We have joining us from uh, across the country, we have colleagues from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, colleagues from the National Park Service many people working together through the magic of telepresence, which is what is being used to bring you these images, not only from the bottom of the ocean, but through the atmosphere, through satellite connections and through cyberspace, to connect different voices in collaborative science, including not only archaeology, but everything that we see down there that speaks to the ocean as a, as a habitat, that speaks to the ocean as a unique environment that speaks to this portion of the notion as well, which has great cultural meaning and significance 
to many people. And with that, and with that, and thanks to telepresence, an opportunity not for us to not only work and communicate with each other, but to talk to all of you out there. Because exploration as it happens is something that is not only funded by the government for science and for better understanding, but also it's something that we all work on together because it's only through expeditions like this and sharing with all of you who watch that we're able to connect not only to the ocean, but also to history and to learn some of those lessons. It's a real privilege to be here with the rest of the team. Thank you for joining us. And now stand by as we take this first look at Yorktown, seeing not only things that were seen by Dr. Ballard and his team 25 years ago, but things that have not been seen by human eyes since Yorktown slipped beneath the surface those decades ago. Thank you to the whole team in Silver Spring. Uh, we are joined also uh, by a talented team here in the control room. We'll pass it over to uh, our science communication fellow, Daniel Kinzer, to lead um, introductions and invite the team to share. Mahalo Nui, Megan. Mahalo to our colleagues um, at the ECC in Silver Spring and everyone here in the van, everyone on board. Uh, my name is Daniel Kinzer. I'm the Science Communication Fellow on board. I live in Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, so privileged um, to be a part of this team, this team that extends so far beyond the vessel, but also it's pretty amazing. We've got a, an incredible group here in the control van with us. I know we're all still catching our breath, um, taking, in, taking in this really sacred moment. So thank you for joining us. Um, please send your questions, your thoughts, your comments uh, on Nautilus Live and join us. Um, join us for this expedition. And yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it to, to my left. Really fortunate to have Mahina here also guiding us into the sacred waters of Papahanaumokuakea and uh, helping us understand um, from a Hawaiian perspective uh, what this means. Mahina. Mahalo, Dan. Thank you so much. And mahalo to all of the viewers joining us and to all of our partners helping along this journey, this huaka'i. O mahinalani kavaleri ko'o inoa. Aloha ahi ahi. Good evening, everyone. My name is mahinalani kavaleri. I'm from the island of O'ahu. It is my honor, my privilege to join each of you as we journey into the depths of the kai'uli, um, the deepest and this dark area within a sacred realm of Kanaloa our ocean deity. Um, this is a very culturally significant place, spiritually significant place to Kanakoivi, to native Hawaiian people. Uh, we believe this is Po, um, a place, a realm of our ancestors, a well akua, a place of our gods, and um, a place where our kupuna come to rest. We believe that we come from these kaiuli, these depths, and we believe that we return to them once more. So I am very honored and very grateful to share this space with you. Mahalo, thank you. Mahalo nui mahina. Um, it's a gift to have you in the van with us and on board for this Ala Amwana Kaiuli Path of the Deep Sea Traveler. Um, such a powerful name with so many layers of meaning and I imagine it, it's hitting all of us uh, in a different way. This is our third dive of the expedition. We've been looking at a couple of other sea mounts um, in this, uh, this region of Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And uh, the, the feeling of, of this dive is showing us uh, the meaning of that name in even a new way, another way. And uh, yeah, I'd love for you to meet uh, the rest of the team in the van. Uh, Val, can I pass it over to you, our amazing watch leader? Thank you, Dan. Uh, this is Val Finlayson, um, one of the co-science leads and uh, uh, the 8 to 12 watch lead. Um, although in this case, uh, in this instance, um, uh, we have uh, the wonderful Mike and Hans running uh, tonight's watch as we dive on uh, the Yorktown. 
Um, it's an absolute honor and privilege, as Mahina was saying, uh, to participate in this. So um, thank all of you for, uh, to all of you for joining. Thank you, ECC, for joining us from Silver Spring. And uh, yeah, um, that's all yeah. I have for now. Yeah, thanks, thank Val. Um, yeah, Mike Brennan again, uh, Search Inc. I'm the other code lead scientist on this expedition and a maritime archaeologist with Search. Um, Hans? Thanks, Mike. I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm here representing the Sanctuary's Office, a maritime archaeologist for NOAA in the Pacific Islands region. And um, this is an important resource, you know, not obviously not only for the, uh, the history and the archaeology of it, but as a resource that needs to be protected. And it's within the monument and it was an important part. The Battle of Midway was an important part of the original proclamation for the original monument. The ships themselves are within the expansion area of the monument, and the area in general is also being considered for sanctuary designation. So we take our responsibilities for protecting historic properties, significant properties like this, seriously. Kukui? Mahalo, Hans. Uh, Mahalo mai kako o Kukui. Uh, my name is Kukui. I'm um, a data, data logger on board. I'm one of the data loggers on board, and I'm so honored and privileged um, to be here with all of you folks today in this, this very special place, this historic place, and this culturally significant place as well. So mahalo. Catalina? Hi, this is Catalina Rubiano, serving as the navigator, uh, coordinating between the pilot team, the archaeology science team, and the bridge. And it's an honor to be here um, to make our initial descent onto the site. This is Renato Kane uh, leading the navigation and mapping team and uh, echoing everyone else's sentiment. It, mm -hmm. is, uh, it is an honor to be here. And I'm Robert Waters. I'm a uh, pilot. Uh, this is really spectacular to be able to be here and see this. Uh, Zach Gonzalez, um, Robert's co-pilot. It, it truly is an honor to be here and witness this. Uh, Amber Flynn, video engineer, and I'm just really grateful for the privilege to be here uh, supporting this team. Thank you. All of us so grateful, um, so humbled. Um, just want to bring the ancestors into the room, into the space, especially those who um, demonstrated so much bravery and courage. Um, in, uh, in wars that we hope never have to be fought again, but uh, we want to honor the fact that um, such tremendous values um, on display on both sides of, of the battle that took place here over 80 years ago, and yeah, look forward to uh, learning as much as we can. Um, incredible team on board, and uh, so lucky to have them as a resource to walk us through what we're seeing. Mike and Hans, do, do you have some initial impressions as as uh, as we've come down on the on this aircraft carrier on the Yorktown? Yeah, so we're um, we're right on the the top of the stack. Um, Nav, what what I'd like to do is when you got you and the pilots are ready, I'd like to bring us um, away from the stack and uh, to a safer distance, and then descend a little bit further to get to the flight deck. I think we, if if I could choose, I would move to the right to the bow. Uh, and start mm -hmm. there. Um, do keep in mind, please, that there were um, anti-aircraft guns and um, small fences poking out at the edge of the flight deck, so we want to come in very carefully uh, as we approach it, but if we can come down, there's also a lot of potential hangs and towers uh, against this, or that were on top of this flight st stack, so I would want to move off-site backwards and then to the right, right. and then reacquire the, uh, the wreck. Yeah, there's a tripod tower if it's still there forward of the stack. So yeah, okay, copy that. Um, pilots, do we want to make a, a ten meter, fifteen meter move yeah, away? Yeah, just ten meters. Yeah. Okay. I think if we square up um, perpendicular to it, yeah. and then we can just reciprocal, or we can just back up from from there and okay. lower. We'll have this horizontal in our sonar. Uh, is someone on ROV nav willing to explain um, when it's safe and when you can? Um, kind of the, the delay that happens when we move the ship or when we come away 
um, because we are so incredibly deep um, for this dive and maybe talk a little bit about look the look around here a bit sure so we have a uh, two-body rov system that we're working or sorry we op oftentimes have a two-body rov system um, where we have a uh, a main rov that's on the end of a long cable um, and then a uh, a secondary but right now we're working just with that with that one single uh, tow sled um, so essentially it's acting um, as a as a weight at the end of this uh, as this cable um, so we're bound by the movements of the ship at the surface to control um, our movements along the XY plane we're using our winch to control our Z our up and down um, so right now we're just kind of aligning ourselves to the to the strike of the wreck um, and we are getting into a safe we happen to land um, very close to the tallest point of the wreck, what we believe. So we're going to essentially uh, square up and back off a little bit. Um, and then we can move safely along the strike. But uh, to your point there, when we move the ship at the surface, um, we've got a, pay, a paid out uh, 5,100 meters of cable right now. So. Um, what happens is we move the ship away and we're moving in small steps just so we can really fine tune our position and, and location in relation to the wreck. So um, you move the ship and it's actually gonna take, you know, about a minute per thousand meters for the ROV at the bottom to respond to that move and back away slowly. So every time we, uh, every time we move, there'll be a, a delay and then uh, ensuring that we've got a good, uh, a nice image camera view of the of the wreck while also maintaining a safe distance. Mahalo, Randy. Thank you for that uh, for that great explanation. This requires so much patience, um, so much collaboration across so many different teams. Um, always does deep sea exploration. But yeah, it looks like the wreck's like 45, right? Yeah, Mike, it looks like off the aft end of the stack, we were looking down at a platform at a lower level. And I don't know that I could make it out, but that's where one of the Mark 33 directors would have been. And then yeah. after that, there would have been the aircraft crane. Right. Yeah. And then I go, yeah. Like, uh, if I square up, like, uh, yeah. A horizontal. Yeah. So a question for uh, Mike or Hans, uh, is the wreck sitting at an angle on the seafloor? Um, it's hard to tell right now. We've only seen uh, just the stack. Uh, from the descriptions from yeah. Ballard's expedition, I believe it's at a slight angle. Uh, we're going to need to see the flight deck yeah. to understand it better. Understood. Thanks. Just to comment on that there, it looks like um, the strike of the wreck is about uh, zero four five. Oh, okay, really? We are looking at the stern, towards the stern on the on the left-hand side, right? Yeah, the Correct. St yeah, the stern will be yeah. the left. Okay. There's that, that platform, but I can't tell if that director is still there. Is our camera going straight down at an angle, straight out? Uh, we are uh, 45 degrees down. Okay, so yeah, it looks like since we look looks like we're looking straight down on it, it looks like the wreck probably is at a forty-five degree angle. Interesting. Yeah, good to know. But it looks like the port hull would be exposed, <laughs> not the starboard hull, which is the one the one that the torpedoes hit. The torpedoes hit the port side on the first torpedo attack. Oh, you're saying that the angle of it, uh, it's tilted on its side. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know. The camera is pointed at a forty-five. Yeah, since we're looking straight down, that means that's pointed at 45 at us. Yeah. Could be, yeah. That's that's consistent with the way that the drawings in the Ballard book show it. Okay. I wonder if that's the, the stub, the position for the mast that was there at the aft end of the upper stack. That yeah. hole right there. Yeah, I think attached. so. There, there should have been a davit on the to the left of that too, which we want to watch out for. Probably not there, but we want to be careful anyway. Yeah. To the left of that platform? 
Yeah. Like further off the left hand of the screen? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Aircraft crane. For those tuning I in believe. online, this is third dive of the Ala Moana Kaiuli expedition and our first um, our first attempt at diving the wreck with Atalanta ROV. Um, tremendous depth, 5,100 meters. And this is the USS Yorktown. Um, and our team on board can mm. share a little bit more about that history. We'll be telling more of the Mo'olilo, or stories of uh, that battle at Midway, um, at Kwe Heleni that, uh, um, that led to the ship uh, sinking. Um, you'll learn about that as you tune in. But this is the USS Yorktown. There are some uh, resources on Nautilus Live for you to learn more about uh, this wreck as well. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's annoying there. Mahalo, Dan. And just to commemorate um, the bravery, I would like to share an olelo no a Hawaiian proverb. Mai kahikina akala i kumukahi. Akavelona akala ilehua. From the sunrise at Kumukahi to the fading sunlight at Lehua, from sunrise to sunset, Kumukahi and Puna on the island of Hawaii was called the land of the sunrise and Lehua the land of the sunset. And this olelo no eau in this proverb often speaks to one's lifespan from birth to transitioning. Here we are in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in this sacred realm of Po, a place where our ancestors come, a place of our ocean deity Kanaloa. Mahalo, Mahina, Mahalo. Both where we come from and where we go. Full life cycle. Most definitely. I'd like to check it with Shoreside. I know that Phil Hartmeyer is there with ocean exploration, and and of course it's through ocean exp NOAA's ocean exploration support that made this mission possible. So we're quite grateful for that. And I know Jim and and Phil and and others are there, and uh, maybe some first impressions at this point. Shoreside, you there? Yeah, we're here, and we've uh, we've been talking here uh, amongst ourselves. We have Frank Thompson from Navy History and Heritage Command, Igor Malone. I do want to remind everybody that we can we can zoom in and, and kind of change our heading to zoom in on any particular thing you want to look at. That's perfect. You're in a good spot right now because looks you know, as we're looking here at the stack and the in the, in the, the funnels and the damage. We're pretty close to an area where one of the uh, a delayed action aerial bomb hit during the battle and uh, went off down below. But it's interesting that in this area, uh, close to this bomb hit, if we are where we think we are, that we're seeing this type of damage here at the, at the stack. Uh, again, just as a reminder to everybody ashore uh, joining us uh, around the world, uh, these are the first looks we really are getting at this wreck despite its discovery two decades ago. And with that, uh, some of what we see may be the results of having been on the bottom for that long, but there's also, as we find with some of these works, a great deal of preservation uh, because it's so deep, so dark, and so cold. And so this could be direct evidence of the number of hits that Yorktown took. Phil? Yeah, Jim, thanks. Um, it's uh, it, it really is inspiring and, and overwhelming almost uh, to imagine what the experience was like for sailors aboard your town. Certainly before it sank, as the torpedoes and the bombs hit, and 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 in its last moments, um, the Naval History and Heritage Command kindly has brought uh, ship plans of the USS Yorktown that we're scouring as we're getting more details from the underwater footage and, and placing us on on the map laid out in the table in front of us. So. I appreciate the shout out, Hanson. Back to you. We're, uh, we're getting a lot of feedback from something. I don't know if it's on your end, but it's it's uh, howling. It sounds like feedback. Yeah, I think that's um, 
So that echo in the room from uh, the shore side. Uh. Yeah, uh, front row, you know, we might lose resolution, but since we're in this position, can we try to zoom on that platform just to the left of the stack? Yep. I'd be curious to see what's there, but we might, you know, be too far above it and, and lose resolution. Can we uh, zoom in there, Amber? Okay. Mahalo to our team, Shoreside, um, for all of your insight um, and That's support good. and collaboration. Yeah. It's going to be hard to maintain focus as we're yeah. bouncing around. Is that what you wanted to see? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if that's the director. Jim, Phil, do you have any impression if that's a Mark 33 director? Hi, everybody. This is Shoreside back. Uh, hopefully we've resolved that uh, feedback issue. How are we sounding? Much better. Much, Much better. better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that's Director Wyrick and Phil working together. Uh, teamwork. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll <break it> all <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we have Frank Thompson with us from Navy History and Heritage Command. Uh, Frank, uh, Frank's been watching this carefully. Frank, you have some insight. <clears throat> well, um, I'm has been with the Naval History and Heritage Command for many years, and I remember when Ballard uh, went out in 1998, and he actually took some of our staff with him. Uh, it was part of that discovery. Um, I had the pleasure and opportunity to go out with Vulcan in 2019 when we located the, uh, the Japanese wreck that you'll be looking at there, too. It's uh, a real honor for, for our office to be involved in these um, in these surveys, we do appreciate all the time and effort that has gone into it. Um, and being able to see these wrecks again and is, uh, is truly inspirational and, and humbling to know that we're looking at uh, okay. the vestige of one of the most important uh, battles in, in U.S. naval history. And looking at the, the first image in particular of the, of the stack area and, and what may be bomb damage from here is, is truly amazing. One of the things for non-naval folks um, is that, of course, ships, naval vessels are built, and damage can be enumerated through things as simple as a frame number. Uh, that is, for those who are not, you know, naval types, a frame, many people known as a rib on a ship. So because of these frame numbers, and because every compartment has a number, you can pretty quickly determine where you are. And so what we do know, just from the very simplest of plans, is that we are, if we are where we think we are at the stack, we're in an area of close to frames 120 and 110 on Yorktown, and this is an area where this delayed action bomb did hit, went through the flight deck, and then went off a few decks down. And just looking at the after-action reports based on the eyewitness descriptions of those who survived the battle, we're roughly in the area where that bomb would have exploded. Amber, can we zoom back out? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, Jim, I'm um, I'm thinking that, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, move back and then uh, acquire the wreck again at the bow and then do uh, go to the other side of the ship, the port side, and do a, an initial run along the, uh, the edge of the flight deck to get an initial assessment. Um, I think that the, so the, the bomb that went off in the deck was patched. Um, but I, I expect that that's probably um, deteriorated. So I think we will see that when we get back to this part of the flight deck uh, during that survey. We concur. From some of the photos of that repair, the historic photos um, of the, the sailors patching with, with two by fours, do we know exactly how that patch was made on the flight deck? That is a good question. I do not. It talked about patching the Saratoga after Kamikaze hit uh, late in the war. Uh, they were using heavy timbers. Uh, they had some light plate. They were laying things down fast. So it's, good. it's a very temporary patch 
All it needs to do is withstand an aircraft sitting on it or landing on it. Uh, it's very likely that that may very well be gone. Uh, and what we might be seeing is more damage. I also know that with Saratoga, after a number of years on the bottom, it went some shallower water and it went through a nuclear blast. Just the same, the patches that were done even in the shipyard that start with the first things to fail, just given the heavy impact of explosions uh, on that vessel. And that, of course, you know, in February 45, it was hit, it was repaired. And then in July of 1946, it was sunk. And those old wounds have reopened. Yeah, so that's one of the things we'll be taking a look at. Also, the um, so it looks like the wreck is canted uh, to starboard, so we're not going to likely see the um, the the, the two, two pro potentially two torpedo hits that sank it from the U-boat. Um, those are on the starboard side, pretty much right below where we are. Uh, I'm not probably going to even have us survey that because the deck edge would be over us, which is dangerous. But we will survey uh, potentially the hull along the port side, which is going to be raised up a bit, and that's where the first torpedoes from the aerial attack struck uh, during its third at the attack, the third attack on it. Um, so that's something that we may be able to see. Oh yeah, that's right, thanks. As the ship settles here, I just want to share again what an incredible mm -hmm. moment this is. Uh, and so much work has come together. So many partners um, to thank and who really being here on the seafloor with these um, really stunning, you know, I think the team is sitting here. I'm certainly sitting here um, just, you know, so pleased and so touched and, you know, catching our breath as we get these first looks and to have uh, descended right on to the stacks and to see these, just a very, very special moment witnessing um, the aircraft carrier Yorktown here. And uh, these Battle of Midway exploration dives, you know, while they're being led by the Ocean Exploration Trust team as part of the Ala Almoana Kaiuli expedition, this voyage into Papahanaumokuakea, um, it is a representation of so many people. Uh, they've been funded by our partners, NOAA Ocean Exploration, via the Ocean yep. Exploration Cooperative Institute. Uh, we thank their support for yep. um, and commitment to exploring the oceans and understanding the oceans. Uh, the battle, yep. you know, the expertise and support and collaboration of so many other partners involved as well. Uh, NOAA Office of, o of National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, Search Inc., Naval History and Heritage Command, the right, International Midway right, Memorial Foundation helping, over this way. helping yeah. us remember these stories in okay. this place. Uh, to all of the partners who manage this special place in Papahanaumokuakea, yeah. the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, so, State of Hawaii, okay. Fish and Wildlife, NOAA, uh, really the I kind of like to keep as, this in view as much as we can. I guess we're going to, that's all going to fall off here and then we can. I would kind of like to just keep a little bit of it still in view, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Megan, for that uh, context. And uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a long journey in planning uh, this mission. And, and as, as we mentioned, a quarter of a century, the first expedition that came to this area, uh, and that really was the starting point. The great work uh, led by Dr. Bob Ballard. Uh, and then about two years ago, when the first uh, proposal was written uh, to go back here uh, and uh, no Office of Ocean Exploration. Through the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute uh, funded an expedition here and about a year ago we started the permitting process, uh, uh, rightfully so, a strict and thorough process. Uh, we are in a very sacred place, the largest marine protected area in the United States and one of the largest in the world. Uh, protected uh, and has the highest levels of protection under state, federal, and even international regulations. It's a World Heritage Site, uh, the only one in the United States distinguished for both its natural and cultural values. Uh, and as a result, the co-trustees of the monument, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife State, um, the State of Hawaii, and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, 
uh, where uh, we, we, we received the privilege of getting permitted to do this work. Uh, and about a year ago, we started conversations with many partners to start planning this mission, brought together many institutions, many collaborators, many experts from different places, different disciplines, and just want to okay. thank everyone for their tremendous contributions uh, to make this possible. It's truly an honor uh, to be part of this mission. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate that. Um, if I may interrupt for some operational speak, um, just briefly. So it looks like we've um, moved off of the wreck um, a comfortable distance. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to check in with you, Mike. Did you want to descend and inspect here while we're here? Or did you want to move towards the bow at this point? I mean, either way, whichever one you guys think is, is safest, I will caution you, though, that this is leaning towards us. Roger. So I think that our operations on this side of, of the wreck are pre would be pretty hazardous okay. for the cable. So I'd like to move towards the bow, keep the wreck in view. You'll have to come down a bit to, to see the yeah. deck. Yeah, so we got to clear the tower here and then, and then come down some? No, we don't need to clear the tower. We need to just move to the right. Yeah, moving along. Yeah, but I mean, then we're going to have to come down, right? This is the highest part. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. order to view the wreck, we're going to have to come down some. Yep. Yeah, so we'll go so past I the, just mean, yeah, going past the tower so that we're, you know, further towards the bow. Right? Correct, yeah. to the right. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with that uh, move along there. Did you want to uh, go in steps and descend and look along the bow, or do you just want to get quickly to the bow so we can get to the other side? I'd like to see, yeah, I'd like to get to the bow and the other side as, I mean, relatively quickly, but sure. yeah, it is, it is we don't need to keep it. In, I'm just, I'm concerned about how much this is leaning over us as we descend uh, yeah. and try to keep it in view. So I'd like to just get away from the stack and then um, maybe reacquire. Okay, yeah. Roger. All right. So let's make some moves at zero four five. Um, this is, where are you at? Zero, yeah. yeah. Just make zero three zero. Zero or so. three zero, and it's a little bit off kilter, so sure, I could yeah. buy that at zero four five. Um, yeah, let's see. Just make a maybe a 30 meter step. How do you feel about that, Robert? Yeah. We'll do 30, and then we'll reassess. Obviously, if anything comes into view, that we don't like, we we come up and we kind of reassess. Okay. Yeah. Bridge now. Can we please move three zero meters at bearing zero four five? Yes. Thank you. As this move settles in, I uh, would love to hear from some of our archaeology colleagues. How do you prepare for a survey like this? Um, as really amazingly quickly when we settled in, you all could identify where we were and build the orientation in your mind of the ship. Can you tell us a little bit about the backstory and the process um, that leads to this stage of the exploration where we're getting the chance to see it here on the seafloor? bring people along. Well, this is Hans. We have the, the fortune to be looking at an already identified vessel from a very historic conflict of which there's been much written about and many plans available. So there are a number of resources and drawings out there that we have with us and have been reviewing in preparation. and. Uh, of course, from the from Robert Ballard's previous mission, we've had glimpses of portions of the wreck as it sits on the seafloor 25 years ago. So that's all excellent background. It's by no means the usual type of situation you find yourself in when you're looking at sunken shipwrecks, certainly on the deep ocean floor. Um, so it's very helpful to know that forward of these stacks there's a considerable amount of the tower on the starboard side to rem that remains. And in fact, even a possible tripod mast that raises up even higher, and we can probably see it in the sonar image as the high point, that we still have to get around before we descend to the flight deck. 
Um, all that's very helpful. This has been this was a major conflict, one of the turning points in the Pacific War, and therefore much has been written about it. Mike? Yeah, I mean, so um, there's a lot that goes into it, including uh, just trying to uh, make sure we know where we're diving. Uh, we had coordinates from, from the original mission 25 years ago, but it was kind of incredible. Earlier today, we did a multi-beam survey uh, of the area. And so uh, just to, to remind everyone, we're at 5,200 meters depth, which is deeper than I've ever had in our OV go uh, that I've, on an expedition I've been on. And uh, it, it's deeper than, than many ROVs can go. Um, so mo typically, hull mounted sonar is not, it's, it's used to map large swaths of the seabed looking at sea mounts and, and canyons and, and that sort of thing. It's not typically used to find shipwrecks, even the size of an aircraft carrier, which is 800 plus me uh, feet long. So uh, we, we did it, did the survey anyway to see if we could require it. And sure enough, there was a small little uh, squarish flat top looking target in the multi-beam, despite being that, at that extreme depth. So we were very excited to see that. Um, we wouldn't have necessarily noticed it had we not known the exact spot to look in, but it was really great to reacquire that target with the sonar system we had and gave us confidence in uh, the ability to dive to this depth at this location. Thank you both. And I do want to acknowledge the technology that we are using. Different different from our normal operations, if you're familiar with um, Nautilus live dives of the past, the, the need and the desire to reach these depths in order to be able to honor this story and visit this place required some changes from us and required different technology, different tools to come to this place. Uh, we are thrilled to have a team of ROVs Little Hercules and Atalanta, who are both rated for these depths down to 6,000 meters. But doing this work in the deep sea is challenging. And earlier in the expedition, we encountered um, some, some problems that we were unable to repair at sea with Little Hercules. And I'm so proud of this team coming together, thinking about the options, examining the possibilities, of course, with the safety of the team and the equipment in mind, uh, but pivoting, pivoting to how could we still learn about this place, honor its stories, collect data that will be valuable to the continued protection and preservation and uh, illustrating the importance of Papa Hanamokuakea. So uh, we are diving in an unusual mode, diving with one ROV only and with the ROV Atalanta. Uh, so uh, long time Nautilus fans, you may notice those changes. Um, if it is your first time on the seafloor with us, we're thrilled you're here and uh, hope you enjoy the views as we're going to be slowly moving this single body vehicle around uh, this important site and examining the details as we go. Yeah, and to, and to jump on that, everybody, including us, <laughs> please be patient. Uh, moving a, a heavy cable around uh, 5,200 meters depth is, is a slow process, so it, it takes a long time for the ship movement to reach the depth as the cable moves along behind it. So we're, we are in progress moving to, as I said earlier, we're gonna try to get over to the flight deck at the bow. It's just gonna take us some time to get the ship moving and, and have the, uh, the vehicle and the cable move along with it eventually. Please, please be patient might be yeah. an appropriate subtitle for this dive. <laughs> I know. Yeah, this is, uh, it's been remarkable watching, uh, watching the team of scientists and engineers and expedition leaders on board the ship as they've uh, dealt with uh, what might have been seen as setbacks, but uh, we like to think of as uh, just uh, little things Kanaloa likes to put in our way just to test our resolve and, and test our patience and our willingness to come into these depths and places and make sure that we're prepared and of the right mindset and uh, this team. Uh, the weather window was a big question. Um, we've been blessed with uh, gentle, gentle winds and, um, and seas, very malier, very calm. Um, that enable us to dive this deeply and, and the team has uh, worked through a number of challenges. This is hard work. Um, Mike's been done a great job of reminding us of that. This is not easy task. Um, many more dives like this fail than succeed and so we're thrilled that um, we've been gifted with this humbling opportunity and yeah, so thankful for this opportunity to learn. Well, I, I will say I've, I've had the pleasure of supporting and, and, and trying to help with some of the geology and biology dives on the seamounts to this point on the mission. 
and I've seen some starfish on the corals, <laughs> and they have patience as well, they our do. starfish friends on those seamounts. Starfish but move slower than vehicles at 5,200 meters yeah, depth. Yeah, but I, I've, I've got to say, being on Nautilus and having brought, you know, this level of, of expertise together in deep ocean research is, is one of the highlights. Absolutely. Because right. we learn from each other, not only when we're in the van on watch and hearing the the talk and the identification of undersea creatures, but off duty hours, sharing talks, sharing our expertise and, and our passion for whatever it is that we do in this multidisciplinary mission. And so, you know, we have OET, the, the trust to thank, and, and ocean exploration support for making this mission happen. It's an incredible learning platform that connects with a lot of classrooms on shore every day, all day long. Absolutely, Hans. Yeah, it's been an, it's been remarkable to, to learn so much from the crew on board and to be able to share this experience with the world. Those viewers who are online, um, the classrooms uh, from kindergarten through universities, uh, um, even some senior living uh, homes and facilities tuning in to talk with us and it's just incredible that we have um, we have this this gift of an opportunity to, to share this with the world. Nautilus is a shore side. Uh, while you're moving this, a couple of quick questions for you. Can you please repeat your estimate of the tilt or the angle at which the vessel is lined? Yeah, I, I mean, this is based on uh, the initial observation. Our, uh, the Atalanta camera was at about a 45 degree angle and it looked like we were staring straight down the stack. So my guess is that it's somewhat about a 45 degree angle on the seabed. But we, we'll, we'll confirm that as we get to the flight deck and look at it more carefully. Understood. Now with that, as you were looking at it, there, the aft end is the damaged end is what it was looking like to us. Is that yes. your conclusion yes. as well? Right. Yeah, we, we for sure are on the starboard side of the, of the, uh, of the, we're on the outer side of the stack. Yeah, Frank, Frank and others will know better than I, but, you know, I thought I was looking at the, the platform a level down where the director might have been, and I, I thought I glimpsed the top, the roundish uh, top of what could be the aircraft crane, which would have been aft of the, of the tower, huh? of the stack. Yeah, we... We saw that as well, Hans, and we, we would, I, we, I think we're of the same mind that that's most likely what you were looking at. So with that, what we're seeing is the area where the final torpedo hits that came in from I-168 took down Yorktown, whereas the aircraft torpedo hits that came earlier are on the opposite side. Yes, so port side, right. That means, as you, yeah, so as you'd observed, what that would suggest is that the fatal wounds, which were visible when the vessel turned and sank, would probably not be visible to us because one, it's underneath the overhang, and second, it might be in the mud. But we may have an opportunity to take a look at damage that came from the aerial torpedo attack, which didn't really get well photographed in these last few images of Yorktown going down. Yeah, exactly. I um, I think I was reading that the uh, the torpedoes from I-168 uh, actually, because the the ship was listing so bad, they actually hit on the bilge keel. So I think even if this was upright, we wouldn't be seeing much of that damage. And now that it's leaning, pretty much sitting on that damage, I think, I don't even think I'm going to have the guys go over to that side because of the deck overhang. Um, but I think we will be able to see um, both the bomb hits and the damage from that, as well as the, uh, the torpedo strikes on the port side. Right. And with that as well, given the angle of the deck, we might also be able to see some more of the bomb damage. Uh, from the various hits, even with the delayed action bombs, yeah. uh, there's still going to be damage that's going to come up through the flight deck. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah, this, um, this, the video is a little deceiving because it looks like we're looking straight down, but actually the, the Atalanta camera is, is angled down at about a 45 degree angle. Um, yeah, it's up a little bit now. It's like 30 up a degrees. Little bit. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. good to know. Thanks. Because we have we have moved off a bit. Yeah. Maybe so we are about halfway across yeah. that 30 meter jump, so a little more than halfway. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, we can see this feature uh, just forward of the stacks in the historic photographs. And just to the right of where the kind of shack, the visible or the, the, the visible area ends, there could be a very tall tower. Okay. Can we uh, uh, zoom in there, Amber? All right, zoom in. That's probably good there. So yeah, it's looking like you're up near the forward at the forward end of the stack. So you should be, if it survives, you should be close to the leg tripod legs. Yeah, there that map with that that observation platform. Yep, and they also had looked like an out, outboard um, yard extending from them. Port and starboard. Hans, can you Are those visible to you? Sorry, go ahead. Hans, can you see those? I can't see that in the video image. I can see it in the historic photographs. The tripod Roger. mast has that observation platform. Was that called a flying bridge up there? I'm not sure. Uh, folks from Naval History and Heritage Command would know better than I. Right next to me, and we're looking at it right now. That's better. Yeah, I'm going back to manual. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go manual on Iris, too. Yeah. Give me a second. Let's see if I can contrast that a little bit more. Uh -huh. Does that help it? Look. Yeah. OK. That's kind of funky there. Look at that. Just to confirm, you said something about a, a possible um, prominence to the uh, to the right in the direction we're moving. Yeah, if you correct? if you look at the um, the hand that I gave you, um, yeah. the middle one, it's to it's to the right of the stack. It's that like tripod tower, yeah, with a bridge on top. That could yeah. be right to our right. We just want to make sure that we're far enough off it. Roger, right. yeah. It, it's probably collapsed, is my guess, but we just want to make sure. Roger, yeah. Uh, it appears. I, I, can't, I don't have the context anymore because we're a bit zoomed. So we're talking about the screen right there. Sorry. Yeah, so we're this is the bow forward here. Yeah. This oh, is that. We're talking about that. Roger. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. We, we were just at this, and there is a tower that could yeah. be to the right. But so we're this is the stack. Yes. Yeah, so so that's platform right here. I that's what we're looking at exactly. right now. Yeah. So we're. We, I think we'd be looking right where that. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, it's not there. Yeah. I yeah. think it's not. I think it's missing. But. Right. Just, Are we still zoomed? We'll see. We are. Yeah. Okay. So, to get, you know, Frank, go ahead. The tripod structure is just referred to as the tripod foremast. Um, okay, tripod foremast, that's helpful, thanks. Thank you, Frank. Mike or Hans, could you share what what the function or purpose of that could be? Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, in the operation of this aircraft carrier, what, you know, what kinds of activities we might have been seeing on this space? Um, I, I'm pretty sure that that's where uh, radar and, and lookout stations were. Jim, do you know more about that? I'm turning this over to Frank Thompson. Yeah. Uh, it's fine for navigation and uh, there was a, uh, I left the there's a machine gun platform up there as well. Uh, but remember, uh, Yorktown, uh, was, when she was designed, carrier aviation was still pretty much a new thing for the yeah. Navy. And um, so, you know, they carriers were often seen as uh, taking over some of the roles that were traditionally cruisers. And those were considered the scouts of the fleet. So you, you had to have a high platform for uh, navigation and, and looking out over the horizon. Yeah, yeah, so, makes sense. You know, if you look at the later, later carriers that came after Yorktown class did not have this feature. Okay, and in wow. fact, with Saratoga, in Saratoga, you just, you know, you, she'd been modified and rebuilt. You just had a higher level and you had directors up there and, and, and radar. But the point with machine guns is an important one. This is a stage in which the thought of an attack Are from the air on you? another Sorry to interrupt, this is a navigator up here. Just a real quick um, for an operational move. We're just about 
at that the stopped position now. So do we want to go ahead and preemptively call the next move I since think it takes so. a minute? Yeah. Okay. Should we do another 30 meter? Yeah. Opt right. the same bearing zero four five. That was that was a 30 meter move. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think we need to. We're still at yeah. the yeah, yeah. We, tripod we've mast been, feels area. like we've barely moved, but okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. we need to keep okay. going for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bridge now. You can see it on the on the map. Yeah. I think this area here is, you know, where that tripod would have been at the yeah, next level so. down from Yeah. yeah. And it's that, gone. That's here. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem like the, the tripod's gone. Um, which is a relief for me because it's <laughs> yeah. not as scary. <laughs> right. And that's, yeah, so we should be I moving think on we towards the as well. Uh, we could have seen some part of the structure before at this yeah. point. So it looks like it is gone. That's, that's, uh, that's reassuring. Yes. <laughs> well, it just, the point is, I mean, this is an early stage in the war. And so there's a mix of air guns on this that get replaced by late war with, you know, real rapid fire weapons. You don't have the quad 40 millimeter guns or the 20 mil airlicans that you would have, say, that we've seen on late war craft. You've got machine guns. You've got that, you've got guns that are shooting shells. Uh, that's all going to change in particular because of battles like this, where the threat is not another ship. It's aircraft coming from another ship, even a hundred miles away. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading, um, so when Nimitz, uh, when Admiral Nimitz took over at Pearl Harbor, um, you know, his, his goal was to, he, he knew which, what fleet he had left after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he, his goal was to just hold out for a year because he knew that, like, the American shipyards were going to start uh, bringing out new new carriers and new cruisers, um, you know, but he, he wasn't just playing defensively, he was also... Uh, being strategic and 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 that's what kind of one of the things that led to this battle is that they were uh, I don't know about that. they put them into to 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 yeah. read some yeah. of the Japanese messages and uh and, and take the initiative in, in certain strategic cases no no I mean the sonar doesn't know anything about where the position was so yeah and Robert, just uh, let you know, I'm still zoomed. Or do you want me to come yeah, back out? Yeah, you can zoom back out. Okay. I think we're gonna have to start one coming down here. Oh. One thing's for sure, Mike and Hans, the image we have of Yorktown based on previous work is already obsolete. Oh it's yeah. It's been changed to this and we're learning more. Great, <laughs> that's what we're here for. Okay, I think we need to come down and start coming down a little bit here to. Yeah, I'm, one, I'm wondering, Mike, if this, this curve there. right here is is the forward end of this level, somewhere in here, and beyond that, it's good to come down. Yeah, it could be. Uh, okay, yeah. Back row, did you go, did you copy that? Um, we are talking about descending a little uh, with our payout. Is that correct, Robert? Yeah. Um, just so we can keep it in view. Yeah. Uh, while also still looking forward. Um, along our move yeah we're you, see that? you know we're yeah like uh, 25 meters away from the thing and yeah we stepped and off a bit and yeah. i think we can afford a little bit yeah um but we'll just keep all eyes so all right coming. so mike as you guys are coming up there's a feature that we're just seeing more as a blob but you could be getting closer to the bridge area of yorktown that if there's a protuberance there that might be a gun director yeah and then directly Forward of that would be would the, be Yorktown's bridge. The bridge, yeah. Are you talking about this, Jim? He he can't see the illustrations. Oh, I sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we see the feature that might be the director, and the full yeah, yeah, forward yeah. Edge. It, that's what we see. It's looking like that to us. So just just forward of that, or to the uh, the right of the image, right. we should be coming up on the bridge. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're just going to bring the ROV down a little bit in the water column to keep the. Uh, the wreck in view while we continue moving to the right.
That slow move to the right. Uh, slow. Let's, let's be patient. <laughs> Mike, you were telling a story uh, about the battle involving the code breakers and uh, some of the reasons why Yorktown and other U.S. carriers were, were actually brought into um, this battle to confront the Japanese. I, I found that really interesting. Can you it tell us a little, bit, the edge there. a little bit about that if we have time? Yeah, so it was... Um, it was similar to, to the Enigma machine um, in, in, the, in Europe, but uh, the Japanese had their own uh, way of coding their radio transmissions. And so uh, the, the U.S. At, uh, at Pearl Harbor were working. Uh, they had a whole bunch of people working on trying to crack the... They were able to intercept the messages, but they couldn't read them. Uh, and they really got to a point where they could read maybe 40%, but that was enough to be able to start stitching together um, kind of an idea of what the Japanese were saying to each other. And they kept zoom in? In. And they kept um, coming across the term AF, uh, and the the code breakers were getting convinced that uh, that stood for mid. Here we go. Yeah, you got a clear shot right there. Yeah, the that's it. Okay. Okay, guys, you're on the bridge. There's the, uh, there's the curve of that. Um, you can actually see what Frank just spotted. Looks like the stubs of the tripod mast aft, and you can also see the rangefinder yeah. right there too. That's a great shot. And uh, we're I'm gonna see the windows when it comes down here too. Yeah, you can. Yeah, Frank thinks he can see the windows of the bridge. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can see that now. See. Yeah. You're right. Do you think that's damage that we're looking at that mass, or is that like coral? It looks like coral. There's coral, coral. Yeah, but, yeah. but corals, uh, we, coral is growing. We think their stubs, you know, passes coral growing on yeah. the, uh, the range fund. That's pretty yeah. cool. But you can see the screen forward of that. Oh, yeah, now you can uh, see the windows on the bridge. Yep. yep. Yeah. That's yeah. a great shot. Frank just said uh, we've rewritten history. Incredible for so our we're, viewers we're online. We're clear forward of that, right? You're looking at the USS Correct. Yorktown. Correct. Yeah, so we're clear we're, forward. We're clear forward. Yep. Okay. Over, over 5,100 meters deep in the waters of Papahanaumokuakea, north of Koihilani, or Midway. Um, very well known yeah. battle. Many consider a key turning point in the war in the Pacific in World War II, the USS Yorktown, and many other vessels actually made their way down to these depths. And um, we have the honor and privilege to have this incredible view, as you just heard from the Exploration Command Center. It's a uh, it's it's historical moment. Yeah. You know, it, it, it certainly is. Gun mount here? It looks like. Yeah. Oh yeah, you no. can see the lower anti-aircraft gun at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. In the gun no. tub. Go ahead, Phil. You know, we're, we're, we're tracking some of these images of the bridge from um, Bob Ballard's Return to Midway uh, book, which produced in high resolution some of the first images in, in, in mass media and print media. Um, and it certainly looks to be more, more coal growth, certainly maybe a bit more concretion, and it's just incredible to see, you know, the natural environment yeah. um, uh, coalescing and, and enveloping historic shipwreck like this. But um, still clear as day for sure from the images we see today. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Phil. Do you think that's a really beautiful part of the story of these sites? You know, we know their we know their history from their wartime service. We know the story of June. 1942 when they sank and now the shipwreck is becoming living on continuing its story becoming the foundation for corals and coral colonies to grow even down here over three miles beneath the surface of the ocean that's right megan reclaimed by kanaloa <laughs> the property of kanaloa uh, amazing Amazing sight to see how the story evolves and uh, new life, new life can uh, can come to this wreck. Yeah, most definitely, Megan. I agree, and that resonates. And I speak with a very humble and 
heavy heart um, seeing this zoom and again? just knowing the bravery and the service uh, men and women here uh, we continue to navigate these waters carefully and I hope we do honor their stories and we are in a very uh, spiritually culturally significant place of Popohanomokuakea uh, Marine National Iris, Iris up a little bit. Iris is and full up. to see That's the, uh, the, cor uh, auto the, flow noisy. the coral yeah. flourishing here. What's yeah. the shiny bit up here? And to see all of these images and to know all of the collaboration, the work that went into this um, to make this happen. So we can tell their mo'olalo, we can share their stories with the world. Uh, Mike in the background, I'm not sure if you're seeing in the sonar there, but um, Particularly as we've moved along here, we can get a sense of the angle there with that tower um, yeah. and the stack being kind of bright towards us. The uh, the occlusion behind it in shadow and then the rest of it. So I, I have to agree with what you're saying about the, the angle at which it rests. Yeah, we'll get a better idea uh, when we can look at the bow head on. Yeah. Um, and then we'll be able to square up to it and, and get an actual like photograph and figure out the angle. But I think it's... I think it's definitely canted quite a bit to the starboard. Roger, yeah. We're getting out of the light. I can point up that high. With this privilege of coming into these spaces and this having this opportunity to explore this deep uh, depth of Kanaloa and the Kaiuli, this depth of the ocean, um, it is also, I would like to point out that it is our kuleana, it is our responsibility to do these stories, these uh, mo'olalo justice, the lives here, um, and may they live on through uh, the mo'olalo that we can share. So just, you know, navigating these waters with all of you, it's definitely an honor and a privilege, and I'm very grateful to be here to share this with you all. Mahalo. Mahalo, mahina. Incredible. Mahalo. From shore side, what we're seeing now is you can see the gun tubs, and those are anti-aircraft weapons, and those are 1.1s. That's an early war weapon that uh, did not prove effective and would be replaced. Uh, but again, we're at an early stage in the, in the war, and you can see those barrels still pointing skyward as they were uh, as Yorktown came under attack during the battle. But again, we're looking down into a gun tub with a 1.1 anti-aircraft weapon. Four of those quads, I think, right, Jim? Sort of looks We've like made some progress yeah. forward. Can we do a full <laughs> zoom out and uh, kind of get some context of what's ahead uh, just as we continue along, make sure there's no snags or anything? There was something, what is that? We're also starting to Do you see that, like, like crescent-shaped? Is that just a lens kind flare? Kind of far away from it now. Roger, yeah, so we can see yeah. that Up there? because that we were so close to that tower and it is at a 45, uh, the rest of the wreck will be a bit further yeah. away from us. So as we, as we drawing, get yeah. in front of that tower, we can consider um, coming a bit closer. Yeah, I uh, to it. I haven't seen anything really rising up. Right off of the, you know, those deck do levels. You, do, do you guys see this thing? Is this just a lens flare here? I can't really tell. I do. I do. I do see it, but I. Can't yeah. Because there's a circle here too. Right. Uh, yeah. Now that we're. Yeah, I think. I well, think I see it moving with the other features that we're seeing from the wreck. I think we need to get so a little closer. We can't. We're too far away to really yeah. be, be imaging structural. things. Roger. Yeah. What's our tilt? Okay. Um, yeah. So we just called in that other 30. We are about, what would you say, about halfway through? Okay. Almost there through the 30, about 20. Okay. So we could... Potentially, Robert, whenever you're comfortable, um, kind of either make the next move yeah, at zero four zero or even just a bump towards the ship along. It's up to, uh, yeah, whatever. maybe, yeah, if we could do 10 towards the ship, maybe. Okay. I mean, um, you're looking at the side there. Right. right. We're clear of the tower area, and we can always come up. So. Sure. If you want to do 10 at 315, uh, which way are we facing? There. Yeah, maybe just do north. Okay, roger that. Yeah, that, yeah. that sounds good. So do a 10, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've fallen off. We can't see anything anymore. Those images of the bridge area were quite haunting. Mike. Yeah. 
I mean, when you consider what the ship went through in the Coral Sea and then the Battle of Midway. I think once we, you know, once we're confident we don't have things sticking up off the deck, then we can get closer. Incredible to watch our nav team and our ROV pilots on the ship all coordinate safely surveying Yorktown. It's not an easy task, um, keeping the ROV safe. It's just an incredible display of teamwork and also just a really exciting moment. There are normally about eight people inside the control room and we've got it <laughs> we've got it packed up this evening. It's a with, full house tonight. Yeah, definitely. Such a mix of emotions and feelings. It's just an incredibly real um, experience. We've been anticipating this. Um, but I think feeling it in, in a lot of ways um, across this expedition team, I'm sure on shore as well, in anticipation, probably many of our viewers um, maybe didn't know exactly what was coming, but we know that we have many people on this team on shore viewing right now live on Nautilus Live or YouTube who have family, uh, who have friends, um, who have their own ancestors that, that played a part in, in this uh, Maybe not necessarily this battle, although certainly this battle, and um, on both sides, on all sides, and uh, just want to celebrate uh, those families coming together and getting to witness this and um, get to getting to be a part of it. So thankful, so thankful for that. Mike, you were sharing a little bit about code breakers earlier. We got uh, we had to oh do yeah. some operational stuff, but I I love hearing that story. So yeah, so um, <laughs> they figured out that a, the code AF uh, was used, and the the code breakers were convinced that they were referring to Midway Island. Um, they did not have any luck convincing Washington of that. So without asking permission, they sent a kind of a fake message. Uh, out that they knew that uh, the Japanese would intercept and they said that Midway Island uh, their desalination plant had failed and then they intercepted a message and broke a code that said that AF had, was out of fresh water so that con confirmed that AF was Midway and so they were able to send Enterprise and Hornet the two aircraft carriers um, <coughs> after Lexington was sunk at the Battle of Coral Sea they sent those up uh, to intercept at Midway and then Yorktown, which was damaged at uh, Coral Sea, they got into dry dock at Pearl Harbor, fixed it, and then they were he was actually able to join them. So the Japanese had thought that they sank Lexington and Yorktown, so were surprised when Yorktown arrived on site, um, that they learned later. Uh, so it, breaking that code allowed the U.S. to send their carriers up there to support Midway Island and really um, be kind of a surprise uh, for the, the four aircraft carrier fleet that uh, Japan had, had sent out to Midway to to knock out that airfield and then take it. Wow! And this was this this battle was only seven months, is that right? After after the attacks on Pearl Harbor and yep. and and a very short amount of time after the Battle of Coral Sea. And uh, yeah, actually, Yorktown sank uh, six months after Pearl Harbor, almost to the minute. Wow! Oh, almost to the minute. Wow. I'd be remiss if I didn't just take this moment to note that. Uh, in that Battle of the Coral Sea, my wife's uncle uh, was flying off of Yorktown uh, in a devastator. He was with Torpedo 5. Uh, he was shot down in the Battle of the Coral Sea, making an attack on Japanese positions and aircraft uh, and shipping near Guadalcanal. He and his radioman survived, were rescued by the local coast watcher, and he arrived back in Pearl Harbor uh, after Yorktown had, of course, gone to Midway without him. Uh, had he gone, he most likely you know, might have been lost. But the, the vessel clearly has a great deal of importance to my wife's family, as does to many others' families, uh, whose uh, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts uh, served in, in this war um, as 
on both sides uh, and a reminder again of the very strong people stories associated with these. Uh, it's amazing to think uh, that uh, so much time has passed and yet so little time. Uh, and I particularly feel privileged to have known so many folks that I met from both sides um, who, who engaged in this, in this terrible war and uh, not all of them came home. Uh, others did. Uh, pretty powerful to see the ship. Got to say. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing, Jim. Um, yeah, it must be um, interesting to to have been shot down, survived, and then when you get back to back home, you you find out that your uh, your ship has has gone both left without you and then gone down without you. Yeah, mahalo, Jim, for your uh, for being willing to share that story with us. And we know there are so many of those personal stories and connections. And this is a this is a sacred moment for for all of us, but especially those families who can who who are living with those stories and and have those deep connections to this vessel and to this time period and and to this conflict. So, uh. my father was a uh, marine at Guadalcanal. Oh, wow. Oh, Bob. Wow. One thing as we're looking at all of this is that everything we're seeing thus far, while we've seen some, some change, uh, we're not seeing anything that looks substantially different in terms of deterioration or damage that wasn't noted in the in the Ballard survey uh, back when the rest was, had been on the bottom for 56 years. Pretty much what we're seeing now is just more evidence of marine growth, uh, particularly some of that coral and other things. It'd be interesting to hear uh, some of the perspectives from the other scientists on board who are looking at this aspect of biological colonization of York now. We hope to see more of that in the survey of the flight deck and along the port side. It's an interesting question, you know, whether large structures like this fall apart slowly over time at a pace or hold together for quite some time and then reach a certain point in their, their lives on the seafloor where they begin to experience catastrophic collapse. It's a question that uh, the moving? Navy and... Park Service asked themselves about the USS Arizona and Pearl Harbor. Out. It's the question that other, other people have asked about other large warships on the seafloor. And, and certainly considering the weight of the flight deck, you know, it's, it's a great question to consider for exploring. We're still 25 meters off it. Yeah. I'm curious if we have estimates on how long uh, a carrier like this with a, a design like this would take to go from the surface to this resting place uh, you know when we when we lost it in that June is that a is it a matter of uh, hours is it a matter of days how long does it take to sink to the bottom um, that's a really good question it would it's not slow uh, I mean it's not terminal velocity but it's not gonna you know it's a lot of weight especially once it fills with water um, I know some people have modeled like Titanic sinking rate and that sort of thing, um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's probably, you know, under two hours, I would say. Okay, pretty That's, that's a pretty total quick. just guess. Yeah, um, I'll take that guess. Yeah, <laughs> but also another thing that we noted with the USS Independence uh, was that was an aircraft carrier that was at Bikini Atoll for the nuclear test and then was scuttled in 1951 off of uh, San Francisco. And we dived it with Nautilus in 2016. So Independence had sunk uh, stern first after they, they sank it with gunfire uh, and, and bombs. Um, and then we noted that it had buried itself bow first into the sediment. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense if the stern sank first uh, down to 1,000 meters. Well, what I, what I think happened is that the flight deck, which was intact on Independence, acted like a sail or a, a kite or a parachute. And so the, the wreck was all the water through the hangar deck because all the doors were blown off uh were was entrained underneath the flight deck and it acted as a parachute so it kind of swung back and forth and the, and the, you know the bow is designed to be 
to cut through water, so the bow would have eventually moved to, to sink first. So um, similarly, Yorktown's flight deck was mostly intact except for a couple of patches. Um, so I expect that uh, it probably had a similar path through the water column. Uh, it had a lot further to go. Um, so it probably also acted like a sail. So that could have slowed its descent a little bit. Uh, a, a ship like Titanic that broke in half probably sank a lot faster, um, just straight to the bottom, especially the bow. Um, but I think it would have it would have sunk pretty quickly once it once it had filled with water. Thank you, Mike. Well, Mike, one of the things that we've, I think we've seen on a couple of these sites is because hulls are done designed hydrodynamically, as you've said, uh, there is a very real possibility of a forward momentum, even if. They we want to make a jump size. closer. Yeah, yeah, we can't see anything here. So I think, do you, uh, another 10 or do you think? I would like another 10. Another 10? Yeah. Okay, we're going to move a little bit closer just because we didn't quite get there on that. Okay, 10. roger that. It's hard to imagine the force of water on the descent for vessels like this. Yeah, absolutely. Jim, you might remember. Well, that's one of when we were diving with the Hawaii Undersea Research Lab and looking at the Japanese submarines I-400, I-401 with Terry Kirby and University of Hawaii when we saw that deck gun on the aft of the submarine, those were torpedoed and sunk intentionally off the south shore of Oahu after we examined them, captured them at the end of the war. And around that deck gun, there was what looked like a canvas tarp and it turned out to be plate metal and the force of the water had just bent that metal around the, the large stern wow. gun on the submarine like it was a canvas tarp. Some of the oh, wow. Titanic folks mentioned that in terms of some of the damage you see. The bow set, the stern, when Titanic broke, more or less came straight down, but the bow glided, and that's why you have that separation between the two. Um, and that's why, of course, the bow is plowed so hard into the mud. But there's also damage where you can see things with that force of water is exactly as you said Hans. Uh, we don't there's ways to model this and i know people have titanic is probably the most studied shipwreck that any of us have ever encountered because it's titanic but <laughs> with all these wrecks i think what we begin to see is a better sense of you know how they transition from ship to shipwreck and that's important because if we start to look at more modern wrecks, we look at wrecks that have the potential to release what they hold, and that includes vessels that were sunk after the war with chemical and biological weapons or, or other types of things, or wrecks that have oil in them. Understanding the process by which they go into the state that we see Yorktown in now helps better inform what we might have to do in the future or what we might encounter as we're down there, because while many of us archaeologists see these shipwrecks as monuments to the past and lessons to learn from, uh, there's also legacies that come with a number of these other wrecks. And I'm particularly thinking about uh, some of the wrecks we've encountered that were deliberately scuttled, like I said, after the war with, with nasty things. In them. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. It's a, it's, it's really interesting to, to think about what we can learn from the journeys that they make from ship to shipwreck, and, uh, and how that can inform all kinds of things, including, you know, of course their legacy, but, but also, uh, you know, the evolution of, of ship design and, and, and these kinds of things are, are, are all. Uh, there's so many lessons that can be learned in, in trying to understand this. It's, Hey, Mike or Hans, what are we seeing up here? The, the bright sonar return on the yeah, port I'm, side there? Yeah, I'm not entirely forward. sure. There was damage um, from torpedo strikes about there, and there was a part of the hull had kind of like uh, become loose and was l resting on part of the flight deck. So it's possible that that has, um, is laying like on top based on how it sank. It may have rolled over on top of the flight deck. Okay. Um, we'll have to be careful, obviously, over there yeah. and see what that is. That's my best guess, because on that part of the, on the port side of the flight deck, there should not be an obstacle or object. No. Right. But that is where the torpedoes hit from the first, from the aerial torpedoes. So my guess is that that's what that is. Okay. Mike, you're talking about that flap of hull that came up from the yeah. aerial torpedo hit, right? Yeah. It that's does certainly show in the sinking photographs. Um, so 
So, and that would be a snag hazard. Yep. It's showing it, up. It actually it's showing up. Yeah. yeah, it's projecting up in some of the images. Um, yeah, we think we're seeing a hard return on that in this in the scanning sonar. Are they getting the sonar image back there in the uh, Maryland? I don't think so. No, Jim, you, you're not able to see the sonar yet, are you? I think they were. What are, what are they getting back there? What are the images they're getting? Uh, that might be a Silver Spring. Sorry. What are you guys able to see besides uh, the video from Atalanta? Can you see the scanning? Uh, sonar? You can hear. We're just getting the uh, the live video feed. We do not do the sonar. Okay, great. Thank you. Could, they just have the video feed. Can we send that to them? Amber, is that something we can send over there? Sorry, um, I was having two conversations. Can you repeat the ask? Yeah, are we able to send the scanning sonar screen uh, out to um, the quad view on Nautilus Live? Not at this time. No? Okay. Thank you. No? Oh. Oh. So, Mike, we've got a very clear view of the vessel um, before it sank, and there is a large strike basically sticking almost straight up off and on the side of the flight deck on that side. Uh, it doesn't, that's an area that didn't get looked at back in the 90s. So it's entirely possible that that, that could be what you're there. Yeah. Rising above the flight deck on that beam, on that edge of the flight deck on the port side. Yeah, we'll be careful about that. Huh. Well, that's, that's a shame they can't see the sonar. Yeah. That would be pretty good. So could we zoom in on it with a camera? Uh, let me uh, confer with uh, Megan and Daniel one moment. That would be fine. I think that would yeah, be useful for them to be able to see that. All right, give me a moment. Thanks, guys. Certainly one of our opportunities and obligations in getting to come to this place under a permit uh, from the co-trustees is, is protecting that place. And that can think, we can think about that in many ways, um, certainly in how we've designed our uh, exploration investigations um, with a non-invasive, um, no sampling. Uh, this is visual only as we look to learn from this place um, and leave it untouched. Um, other ways, you know, we hope by all of our data and all of the partnerships and collaborators set up that um, all that we learn will go into strengthening people's connections with Papahanaumokuakea and uh, both the protection of cultural heritage of this era and also lending into uh, protections and care for this place. This is a very special location in the world and it is currently nominated for a National Marine Sanctuary designation, which uh, in addition to the protections of the monument would layer additional protections onto this place for the future. Um, maintain it as a place we can continue to learn from long into the future um, and study as we learn more about our oceans, learn how they're changing, um, learn from the past and make the best choices for how we can care for the planet as we go forward. can only speak for myself, Megan, but it's, uh, it's a responsibility that um, not only lives on a permit, but I think it just, we f I feel it. I feel it, uh, something that's in my mind and, and in my heart as we enter these sacred waters and um, incredibly present with that as we, uh, as we dive on, on this site. Without right. a doubt. Well, I think we need to come down some more. Yeah, we're, we got a little bit closer and it looks like we may have some space to move down. Yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'm start seeing it now. 
yeah. beneath us. We're uh, 22 meters up. Edge of the flight deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Forward of the bridge. I was watching it. Uh, Should be flat. Watching at home, we're, we're reacquiring the, the wreck now. If you're just now turning in, we're at the USS Yorktown wreck site at um, over 5,100 meters deep, five kilometers beneath the surface of the ocean in Papahanao Mokuakea. This is the Ala Amoana Kaiuli expedition. Um, this is a wreck site from a very well-known battle in World War II, the Battle of Midway, north of uh, Midway Island, Midway Atoll, Koihi Lene. I think we're starting to pick up the edge of the flight deck, forward of the bridge. I would guess aft of the forward elevator, maybe aft of what I think are the five inch guns. So Frank and Phil, you'd know better than I, but now it's coming into view. 14 meters off the bottom here. I'll hold there. There should be some smaller gun positions here, maybe some 50 caliber. Yes, anyone who'd like to share, please, please tell us more about where we're at and what we're seeing. And just interjecting really quick for our shore team that um, sonar is on SAT-3. Thank you very much. We're getting some vignetting. What is? I'm not sure what that shadow is. Um, well, we're we're kind of out of the light pool there. We're pointed up. Gotcha. We're only down 14 degrees, so the lights are shining down. We need to get closer to the wreck to keep gotcha. it in the light pool. I think uh, you know if we're pretty happy with not having things to get hung up in here, we can move in. Right. I think we're good with not having things that we're going to run into and we can move in closer. We've, we've stepped twice now. So. But we're still, I'm pointed, you know, 14 degrees down. So it's still pretty far away. So that's 25 meters per, the, yeah. Yeah. If you are just tuning in. We can, yeah, we can drop the range down. We've just reacquired the USS Yorktown. We, um, well, I mean, I can see it. <laughs> you can hear Robert Waters and our nav team. They're, they're carefully maneuvering around the, around the vessel. Yep, yep. And, uh, Forward starboard side of the flight deck. I, I think I'm much more comfortable knowing where things are than, than uh, you know, and yeah. How close to the bow are we, Hans? Are we getting are we getting pretty close, or is it still a couple hundred feet away? We're not that close to the bow. I I would guess we're still aft of the forward elevator. Hans, could you give us a a big picture overview of this aircraft carrier? Kind of how large is the ship? As you talk about the elevators, how many did it have? Kind of maybe bow to stern. What are what are any of the major features that people would notice looking at this ship? Well, I'm only 14 meters out the bottom, so, I mean, we're, this is going into the dirt here, so I think we need to go Okay, sh let's more. continue um, towards the bow. Yeah. Do you want to, mm, how, how much do you want to jump? Uh, uh, yeah, we can, 20 we're, meters? we're 60 meters to the bow, I think. Okay, so we make a 30 meter jump? Can, yeah, with 30 meters, like, yeah. And then maybe not just four or five. Go four or five? Like, no, I would no. go more like two five. Two five? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. And, okay. and, and if you want to go over the flight deck more, if you feel safe, that would give us more view. But it's your call about the safety. I of think the we just we're trying to figure out if there's anything, Atalanta. any, you know, uh, hazards right. sticking up off the deck. And I right. think once we know that, then we can get in closer. Yeah. Well, 
Well, in answer to your question, you know, they didn't call them flat tops for nothing. So <laughs> yeah. know, once once you're away <laughs> from the, the bridge and the structure yeah. on the starboard well, side. Well, there can be lines and things there can. that float there can, up off of the deck. In terms know. of major features, right. yeah, we'd, we'd be looking at We don't, we don't want the, lines, though. The, the flat flight deck, the aft elevator, midships elevator, and forward elevator. And then along the sides are where the defensive uh, anti-aircraft guns are, the 5-inch guns, the 1.1-inch quads, 50-caliber machine guns. But the deck, of course, is flat. It's yeah. a, it's How many a, aircraft would this service, Hans, when, uh, in, at that stage, in, in early stage in World War II, how many planes would be on the deck or taking, on, uh, taking off and landing here? Yeah, I think it would be dozens, but I wouldn't have the exact number. Phil, Frank, uh, from Shoreside at the command center, do you have... Uh, remember the number of aircraft that Yorktown sailed with? Well, yeah, we were discussing this earlier. You know, as built, Yorktown was designed to carry just about 90 aircraft. But Can we zoom in? At the time, sure. at the time of the battle, it, um, it was a... Are we looking at a Davit or something here? What's this sticking out? I'll try pushing a little yeah, more. Yeah, that, that could be. That could be a davit there, and maybe a five-inch gun just forward of it. One of the larger uh, anti-aircraft guns that the, the carrier had, which means we would be just aft of the forward elevator. But uh, 90 aircraft, that's that's a considerable number. And what's so the you, you're at a five-inch gun. Yeah. That's an anti-aircraft weapon. Yep. So you're um, say again, command center, there's a little bit of feedback. That's an anti aircraft gun. Yep. Five inch. I think there were eight of them. It's a five inch. On the Yorktown? And they weren't in, in these are not the ones that were thrown overboard. Remember, the salvage crews threw a number of the 20 mils off to try to uh, increase better the chances for stability. Quite a few cables and things laying across the deck. Yeah. There. This would all be the cat catwalk along the side. Is that correct, Jim? Is that the opening? And that's looking down into the hangar deck too. Yeah. Below, yeah. The, below it, yeah. That's, that's it. That's the hangar deck below the flight deck. Yeah, and yeah. The, that's right there. That's, that's the elevator opening. Yeah, Alexis wow. and uh, that noted that. Yeah. Incredible to get a chance to look down into where all those aircraft. The key part. This ship's fighting function would have been kept. Could our archaeology team explain how uh, we often see photos yeah. of the planes all staged on the flight deck? How often were they kept in that configuration, or you know, were the elevators used to to stow planes below, or what was the function there? U.S. carrier doctrine um, always uh, to maximize aircraft uh, capability use what they call a deck park. So the air crew was usually kept up on the flight deck. Uh, the hangar deck was meant for servicing aircraft, repairs, um, and that's what the um, the elevators were for. Was to you know obviously transport the aircraft to and from the flight deck. Occasionally, if they were armed and fueled on the flight deck, they could, or sorry, on the hangar deck, they could be, the hangars were open, meaning that the sides could open up to allow them to actually turn the engines over to warm them up before sending them up to the flight deck for takeoff. Um, so most of the time you see pictures of U.S. carriers at this time, you're going to see, you know, the air group pretty much parked on the flight deck aft, and they would, um, of course, take off and then would land to uh, on the stern and then would be ranged forward while they were recovering air, uh, while they were recovering the air group. And then they would be rushed or set down the hangar from the forward flight deck, uh, elevator pits, um, and then rearmed and set back up for, for launch. 
Uh, it's interesting to note that the British and the Japanese Navy carrier doctrines were very different. They used uh, the hangar as the place where they would fuel and arm the aircraft, and the flight deck was mainly just used for takeoff and landing. And the design of them, the hangars were different in limited capability of, of carrying larger numbers. Right. Uh, one of the many differences, um, I found it fascinating that the Japanese main carriers were built with multiple flight decks initially. It didn't turn out to be a good idea, and they consolidated to one main flight deck, but... Um, they adopted the British system. Uh, they would launch aircraft right out of the hangar. You're right on that. But then as aircraft got heavier and larger, it became impractical to do that. And so the forward flight decks were converted to, to hangar space, and then the flight deck was, uh, the main flight deck was extended all the way up to the bow. Right. But the British and the Japanese carriers maintained a double hangar design um, pretty much uh, through, the, through World War II. Um, so uh, Kaga and Akagi, uh, which would be Yorktown, would be Yorktown's contemporaries. Uh, they had, you know, instead of one hangar deck, they had two, but they were larger ships. How much of the length of an aircraft carrier, you know, Yorktown overall was 824 feet long. How much space does it take to, in this era to land an aircraft on deck? I, I find it, I'm, my mind is just blown that there's combination parking deck for uh, an air group and also the active uh, runway and landing zone. Well, the aircraft involve, you know, employ some called raster wires, which would um, you know, trap the plane as it landed. So, um, you know, the, the length of the flight really was kind of immaterial for takeoff and landing. It was more for takeoff than, than landing. Um, and for takeoff, the carriers would turn into the wind and steam as fast as they could to get the airflow over the deck to help the planes lift off, which was crucial in the days before catapults were, um, were available to um, do that. And then some of the, the Essexes did carry hydraulic catapults uh, at the, during World War II. And so they were able to launch you know, heavier planes armed and you know, fueled with uh, heavier payloads. But Yorktown did not have catapults, but she did have the ruster gear to uh, trap planes as they landed. Oh. And um, because the flight decks were axial and not like the angled decks we'll see today, they also carried um, a ruster gear that could be rigged on the forward flight deck too in case they had to steam in reverse to recover over the bow. And that was done during World War II a couple of times when, um, when damage was done to some of the ships. I think we're starting yeah, I, to I see think the, the, the forward five-inch gun second of the five-inch yep. guns on the starboard side. I think so, too. And these, these were a lot more challenging for the crews from from Haman and, and from Yorktown, too, to jettison. So seeing these five-inch guns after a lot of the anti-aircraft machine guns were, were removed is right on target. The, the five-inch 30 is a big gun. If they were five listening to the... Oh, go ahead. I was saying the five-inch thirty-eight mount or guns you're looking now, the single mount. Um, it, uh, towards the uh, months after this, uh, after Midway, the dual mount five-inch thirty-eight came out, and that became kind of a standard anti-aircraft weapon on on carriers uh, for the rest of the war. Um, they were. These are open mounts. Uh, the ones that came later were built in, clo in closed mounts. We actually have one on display in the museum here in D.C. Um, and it was a remarkable weapon that served up in the last 5-inch 38 left the fleet in 1991. Oh, I'm sorry, 1995. And that was on the cruiser Long Beach. So you're looking at a weapon that had an incredible lifespan. I think my uh, I think my dad worked on the radar system on the cruiser Long Beach. On the, if memory serves, he worked for Hughes Aircraft. 
I would imagine, Phil if, uh, and Frank, that if she was listening to port uh, and, and trying to suppress the fires, that they'd be jettisoning the guns on the port side. The 20 millimeters. Yeah, it's a great observation, Hans. And, yeah. You know, and, and I, you know, the jettisoning that I was thinking about was, was I think perhaps on the 7th of June, um, trying to correct some of the list by uh, by ditching weight in addition to, to aircraft that was on the uh, on the flight deck. Right. Hans, could you tell us more about that timeline? Um, we've talked about, you know, we've mentioned a few times here jettisoning mentioned that the battle began on the 4th, but uh, could you walk us through those intermediate days in Yorktown story? Uh, I might not be as familiar with others about the entire or timeline, but major. I can yeah. tell you yes. that the, the, ma the majority of the action was on June 4th, and um, but it wasn't until the 7th when she was attacked by a submarine the second time. So the, tor zoom in? the torpedo hits on the port side were, was were earlier. Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we're already about halfway in right and now. And I'm not sure if they were on the 4th or not. Folks in the command center can correct me, but I know that the, yeah. the submarine attack on the 7th less. was a surprise, and that's the one that sent her to the bottom. Because for a long time, for days, they thought they had the chance of saving the Yorktown. Yeah, so it was bombed uh, on the 4th uh, on the flight deck. And they were able to patch it and uh, put out the fire and, and stabilize the ship so quickly um, that the, another raid from uh, Hiryu thought it was a different aircraft carrier and they bombed it again. And then they, they also hit it with aerial torpedoes at the time. That was on the port side and that's the damage that we think we'll be seeing when we flip around to the other side. And then it continued to list they, they put out the fires, they corrected the list, they patched some little holes, um, and then it was, I think the, I think it was late late on the 6th uh, that it was hit by by I-168 with two torpedoes, one, well, it fired four torpedoes, one missed, one hit him, and, and then uh, two hit Yorktown. Yeah. Um, so it was yeah. really like, it was really yeah, quite a ways after the, after Coming the... Out? main action of the battle that Yorktown was actually sunk. Yeah. It looks like the wood on the flight deck is decently preserved. Yeah, that would be a really good view of the ladder. See that? On the what? The ladder. Yep. And even still, you know, with those final two blows, I mean, it still took a while for Yorktown to finally sink. It's incredible. Yeah. Can we uh, zoom in on that ladder? Yep. Zoom in. Zoom in. Yeah, that's really the amazing thing for a vessel that was damaged at the Coral Sea that had 72 hours to repair at Pearl Harbor that surprised everyone by making it to the battle at midway in time, and, and fortunately so, and then uh, being damaged in the battle and putting out those fires and remaining afloat yeah. for so long. And in fact, you know, I think the order was to abandon ship and uh, the Yorktown still didn't sink, though. So when the Hammond came aboard, uh, came alongside, they were bringing on a damage crew and still trying to save the ship, and hoping to tow her back to tow the ship back to Pearl Harbor. One thing that this um, this ladder can can show viewers is the scale of what we're seeing. Like the anti-aircraft guns kind of look small when you're like standing back from them, but if you look at that ladder, you can you can kind of tell the scale of what a person would be like on the on these decks. Um, and just kind of show you the sheer size of the wreck that we're looking at. What's a full crew, Mike or Hans, on board of Yorktown? How many, oh, how many people would it be carrying? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, tw something Two, like 1,200? No. 2,217. Thanks, Megan. Thank <laughs> you, Megan. <laughs> I was off by about 1,000. <laughs> yeah. I think aircraft carriers today have something like 5,000 crews. Wow. That really? Right? Oh my gosh. Wow. All right. Hey, you wanted to know the complement, um, the ship's complement was 83 officers, 90 chief petty officers, and 1,280 men for a total of 1,519. That's without the air group. Okay. Um, if, you ha if you include the air group, the total ship and air group is about 29. 119. Wow. Wow. So yeah. So there's so, a ship's crew, 
and then there's the air, air the airplane mechanics the pilots that that whole crew so totally uh different numbers yeah it's like a whole city on a, on a vessel yeah yeah Nautilus, this is short can you come out of the zoom and back off a little bit by that ladder what we were seeing here the entire team here noticed what looked to be damage which was not has not been recorded previously okay. so if you can give us a wider view yep. we want to look back in that area over by that ladder because yep. there looks there, there looks damaged okay. i was wondering if um, that was battle yeah. damage or just decay or was a result of landing on the sea don't know Oh, that, it, um, that's the shot we needed. Keep, yeah. right. keep her there. Could you zoom in a little on the left? Can you, Alexis just asked if you could zoom in a little on the left, please. Can you zoom in again? That, Are you looking for more? Yep. How's that for the view? It's a great shot. Thank you. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, bomb hit. Oh, yeah. Cause, quote, unquote, fragment damage. Um, that, that's, okay, that fragment damage. That's one more. Yeah, it's the um, this is from this is the Bureau of Ships, uh, you know, after action report, and it has a heavy bomb exploded close on surface caused fragment damage, but they've got a see that I see where it pulled forward okay, so the, we are. the bomb exploded in the water, but really near it. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. It's close to where they have it on the drawing, but yeah. For those just tuning in, we're on the USS Yorktown shipwreck over 5,100 meters, 5,100 meters deep inside Papahanao Mokuakea um, Marine National Monument. And uh, just on the starboard side, um, you're, you're looking at the starboard side of the deck, looking in the hangar deck, and just seeing some of the damage from, sounds like a, sur a bomb that went off on the surface just nearby. Uh, we've been just humbled and, and, uh, and amazed at the opportunity to s witness this bit of history here on board the Nautilus with our team ashore in the Expedition Command Center out in Maryland. And we appreciate all of you for tuning in with us. You can send in your questions or your comments, your stories uh, on Nautilus Live. I'm Daniel Kinzer. I'm a science communication fellow in the control van and just here with a remarkable team of archaeologists, marine archaeologists and scientists, ROV pilots, navigators. Um, just so so amazed at what we're uh, what we're witnessing and 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 the the amount of collaboration that we're witnessing see what we're got going on here. to make this happen. Do you want me to come back out on the yeah, camera? Yeah, let's come back out on the zoom. Okay. okay. There you go. So we are settled here now. Atlanta settled in. Do we want to still spend more time here? Or should we plan a next move? Um, I think we can continue moving um, to the right, okay. towards the bow. Okay. Um, is that bearing 025? Uh, well, I think we that'll take close? us over it. Yeah. Okay. Probably. How about 040? Does this look like rusticles to you, Mike? Oh, that's or a good question. Or just kind of corrosion or biological material dripping off the edge of the gun tub. It could be rusticles, um, like from this, the corroding steel underneath the flight deck, like up here. Are you looking at the area again? 
Is that yeah. under the anti-aircraft gun? Yeah, also that. Gotcha. Yeah, I think they could be rusticles. It's a good example of, you know, the differential corrosion on different metals of the five inch gun. And yeah. Some metals make a better suitable substrate for uh, colonization and some metals do better underwater. And oh, and here's a, a ladder for scale next to this. Uh, yeah. Five inch gun, yeah, that's quite large. <laughs> Yeah, to your note on uh, colonization there, Hans, I've uh, been noticing that there are a number of anemones that seem to be uh, colonizing some of these cables that we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah, we saw that on uh, a couple other wrecks. There's uh, the Robert E. Lee uh, was a passenger ship that was sunk by a U-boat in the Gulf of Mexico. It had uh, anemones all over it. Uh, and then there was a, a Greek ship, the Dodecanesis, off of Turkey, uh, that sank in a storm in the 50s that also had a bunch of those kind of colonizing the cables. It's nice uh, in the water column, yeah. hard substrate to attach onto. Yeah, yeah and it, it speaks to how these become, uh, these wrecks become part of the uh, environment once they're there. Yeah. Yeah. What's that differential band on the flight deck? We kept getting a peek at it. Uh, nope. A little to the aft now. Never mind. I just I just want to look. We're gotcha. headed up this way. I just yeah, yeah, no, sure you're good. We're okay. Yeah, yeah. You want me to come back out? Yeah. Come back okay. Out. So there's, there are lines hanging down off of there. Yeah. yeah. Cables or whatever. Yep. Can we glance towards the aft a bit? Yep. Uh, Jim uh, earlier uh, said that this is like having a, a chandelier down on a 18,000 foot cable. I said, well, at least uh, the chandelier has thrusters. <laughs> yeah. 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 On the plans anyway, just forward of the elevator oh, yeah. in the deck, there's this banding. Yeah. Something different on the flight deck, and I think we see it well, there. Well, it might be a mark stripe to... Uh, yeah, to judge distance. Yeah, or to in here too. Yeah. I'd be a guess, though. It also looks like they're directly over each of the anti-aircraft guns. I wonder if it's so the pilots can be like, oh, there's a gun there or something. Those bands might also be uh, expansion joints. Just remember, um, on U.S. carriers at this time, the flight deck is um, actually a superstructure, so it we needed to have something to bend and all that, so it could be expansion joints. Oh, yeah. Well. That makes sense. That makes sense. Flight deck expansion joint. Fascinating vessel. We've been here, acquired uh, the Yorktown, USS Yorktown, uh, roughly two hours ago, and uh, have been moving very slowly, um, making sure to avoid any potential obstacles hanging off the deck. Um, Sounds like is it is it right that uh, the vessel is kind of listing to the to the starboard at about 45 degrees roughly? Yeah, it's listing towards us. We're gonna get a better idea of that once we come around to the bow and we can square off against on the bow and see kind of measure that angle there. It's it's probably not quite as severe as 45 degrees, but it feels like that. And viewers are looking now towards the bow. It's kind of the angle that you see. You see some uh, some the artillery five inch anti-aircraft gun, you can see into the hangar deck. And, uh, yeah, we're moving slowly with the ship, just being very careful um, as Nautilus creeps forward. 
Uh, we slowly swing. Atalanta is the ROV that's providing us with this incredible, incredible view. Some amazing pilots with Robert, Robert and, and Zach up front helping pilot and Catalina navigate. And, uh, keeping the ROV safe and the operation going. So you have to be a little patient, but there's uh, a lot of stories to tell. So we appreciate um, some of our experts on shore in Maryland and also our experts here in the control van for helping give us all some context on the, the history and um, military history and the design of the vessel um, associated with this uh, sacred place. We especially appreciate all of you viewing who are sharing stories in the comments about your own ties to this era.